Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. We are so thankful you have joined us this morning. Stand up and worship with us. All right, let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Father, thank you for being the way maker. Thank you so much for how much you love us. Oh, the darkness that's been surrounding us, Lord. You know, none of it is a mystery to you, Father. And I just pray that as we look towards you and we seek your face and we call upon your name and we ask you to hear us and to heal our land, show us what you want us to do, Father. Show us how you want us to represent you. We love you so much and all we want to do is to be your hands and feet, Lord. But that's sometimes hard in these times, Lord. And so we just ask that you show up. Continue to show us which way to go. We thank you. We love you. And we just pray that there's an extra sense of peace as we continue in our worship journey today. That you just be able to uh, place a seed into our hearts so that we continue to grow in the way that will make you proud of us as your children. And we ask this in your name. Amen. So now as we continue in worship with the announcements. Good morning and welcome to St. John's. My name is Laura Ellsworth and we are so happy you are here to worship with us this morning. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we invite you to fill out a connect card at the link in the description. If you feel led to make an offering, you can do that at the link in the description as well. After the service, head over to St. John's Kids with Steve and Cassie Quist, and don't forget to check out the small groups throughout the week. Now, let us prepare our hearts to hear God's word. Good morning again. Welcome to worship here at St. John's. My name is Tom. I am the pastor here, and on behalf of our whole leadership, everyone here, we're just so grateful that you've joined us in worship. Um, before we get into God's word this morning, I just want to say, uh, on, again, on behalf of our church, congratulations to all the seniors here in Elkhorn and throughout the region. It was really awesome, at least in our town, to be able to see uh, the seniors stroll this last week and the way people have come together to support one another. And uh, so we're praying for you, seniors. We're praying for senior families out there. And uh, why don't we join together and just say a quick prayer as we get into God's word. Lord Jesus, Jesus, I just want to thank you that in so many ways, as different as our world looks in this moment, you have blessed us because we are together. God, we pray that you continue to bless the uh, seniors in our community as they look ahead at the next chapter of their life. There's so much unknown, but for those of us who have already been through that portion of our life, we know that there's so much unknown even as we make plans and so we pray, God, that you would direct their steps, be with our students, be with their families, and be with all of us as we continue to face so much turmoil, so much tension, so much unknown. Help us to know that you're with us. And I pray, God, that you would help us to know that as we open up your word, that these words would not just be words on a page, but that your Holy Spirit would use them to convict our hearts, to change, to be more like you, and to draw others closer to you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to open it up. Wherever you're at right now, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. And we are going to climb through this text together as part of the message. So we're not going to read it at the beginning, um, but we're going to climb through it. And I want you to have it in front of you so that you can take notes, scribble. If you don't have a Bible, open it up on your Bible app and your phone, um, whatever it is that you have. Um, but today we're kicking off a brand new sermon series. It's called The Art of Neighboring. And it's based on a book and a small group series. Two of our small groups are actually already studying it. If you want to join them, they'd love to have you be a part of that. And I will be sending an email this weekend. You might have already gotten it, depending on when you're worshiping with us, with some resources that you can use to go deeper into this over the coming weeks. Uh, but the reason that we're feeling led to, to go in this direction, at least on Sunday mornings and in some of our groups, is that this might just be the most important moment in many of our lifetimes to know how to be a neighbor. As I, I shared a couple of weeks ago, uh, our world is kind of starting to open up again, at least in this particular area. We're looking for ways to, to be able to be physically present with our loved ones as a church even. And, and even if it's outdoors or in smaller groups, I don't want us as a church, when we come back together, to leave the neighborhood. 
what I shared a couple weeks ago is, is that I believe, and so many of us believe, that, that the reason God scattered us, or one of the reasons, is because we needed to learn how to love those who are close to us. Those are the people that God has called us to serve, and, and those are our neighbors. But before we talk about how to serve our neighbors, we've, we've got to begin with a more very basic question, and that's the question we're going to talk about today. It's the question, who is my neighbor? And, and I mean that from a very practical perspective. Like, like, think about it. We know the Bible says that we're called to love our neighbor, but what are we talking about? Are we talking about people that share a lot line with us? Uh, do I have to cross the street? Does it matter if there's a fence? Do I only reach out to my neighbors that I like? If I live out in the boonies and I don't have any neighbors, does that mean I just get to love God and I don't have to worry about the love neighbor part? Well, thankfully, Jesus actually answers this question. And he answers it in a pretty black and white way in Luke chapter 10. And it's, it's black and white and simple, but it's also incredibly challenging for the times that we're living in right now. And so that's why we're turning here. Now, now again, this, this whole interaction, it really surrounds the question, who is my neighbor? But before we get to the question, the context of that is, is really important. And so take a look at verse 25. It says, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so what we have here is we have this Jewish lawyer. That's who this expert of the law is. And it begins with really nothing to do uh, about neighboring, being a good neighbor, anything like this. What, what he wants Jesus to answer is what Jesus believes it's going to take to get to heaven. And, and I think about that question, and I think, you know, if I had an opportunity to sit down with Jesus and I only had one question, I'd probably ask Jesus the same question. And the law that this guy's an expert in is the Old Testament. It's the Jewish law. It's the, the regulations for their culture and their society. And it's, it's a lot more than what the Bible is for us today in American culture because the religious laws for the Jews were laws that the Roman Empire actually allowed them to hold their people accountable to. This is why when, when Jesus was arrested, remember, before he went to the cross, he was arrested by religious leaders. They had a right and a, an ability to be able to do that. Uh, they couldn't execute him. That's why Pontius Pilate, on behalf of Rome, had the ultimate power to condemn Jesus to death. But they still had a lot of pull. And so in Jesus' day, you could really say it was... It was God first for the Jews, but it was as long as Caesar said it was okay. It was God first as long as Caesar said it was okay. And, and we can actually get stuck in that kind of thinking too as Americans if we expect our governments to have all the answers and to always act and, and provide the way God would. And this is a lot of what we talked about last week when Steve Quist and I had a conversation about conflict and differences of political opinions and COVID opinions and all of those things, is, is that we can't expect the world to provide to us what only God can provide. It never will. And what we see is that when we expect it to, what ends up happening is it leads to corruption both in faith and in government. You can see lots of examples of that today, and you saw lots of examples of that in Jesus' day as well. And so, so this lawyer, he, he asked Jesus, he's teacher of the law, he says, how do you interpret all of the laws and the statutes that we're responsible to follow? How do you interpret these as they relate to how to get to heaven? In other words, how good does somebody have to be? And like any good teacher, Jesus knows his student. He knows that he's really trying to get at something a little bit deeper. And so instead of just answering the question, he asks him another question. He says, you're a lawyer. What's written in the law? How do you read it? And this guy answers. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. And so this, this is how the entire Old Testament is boiled down. That's why this religious leader answered the question that way. Jesus answered the question the same way in other places, and almost any God-fearing Jew would have known 
that all of the laws in the Old Testament all hinge on those two things. Like, like all the, the laws and rituals about worship and about sacrifice and about offerings, it really all comes down to how they, they act out their love for God. And then you've got all of the laws and the commands about things like marriage and, and not stealing from other people and murdering and, and family and society and all that kind of falls into loving your neighbor. And see, this, this religious leader, he already knew all of that. And, and so his next question is, is kind of the question that oftentimes gives lawyers a bad name. It's it, verse 29. It says, he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In other words, he says, I, I know what the law says, right? But if the commandment about loving your neighbor was a pass-fail class in college, then what would I have to do to pass? Like, that's basically what he's asking. And, and, and I just want to point something out here, right? Notice what the man doesn't ask. He doesn't ask any questions about loving God, does he? He doesn't ask any questions about, about worship or whether his offerings are good enough or, or how much, you know, all of this stuff, how much he serves, all that, whatever. And, and I can only assume that the reason he doesn't ask is because on that side of things, he figures he's doing just fine. He's at church on Sunday. He's at church on Wednesday. He's leading five Bible studies. He's doing all kinds of stuff. He lives at the church, and, and he's busy, right? He's got all sorts of stuff. But loving my neighbor... That's the thing that he's not quite so sure he's doing enough of. And if he does more than enough, it might cramp his style. I mean, I told you, he's pretty busy. He's doing all this stuff at church. Probably doesn't have a whole lot of time. He's a lawyer. He's a busy man. And so he just wants Jesus to break it down. Just, just break it down for me. Make it simple. Tell me, what do I have to do so that I can go back to doing all the other things I just want to do? And, and I just want to admit right now, okay? That as a pastor, as somebody who, I'm not a lawyer, but I do try to, to prayerfully interpret the law. And, and as a Christian, I'm trying to interpret it, not just to, to teach you, but to teach myself and to be able to, to be faithful to this. Sometimes I ask that same question. What do I have to do in order to pass the test? Just the bare minimum. In other words, who is my neighbor? And I know you ask the same question as well. At the beginning of the pandemic, right? right? We, we all ask that question, like, who's my neighbor? Like, if I'm not part of the, the high-risk group of people whose lives are, are really, truly threatened, and, and all of us are on some level, but, but the people that have the most threat from being impacted by COVID-19, if I'm not one of those people, then are those people my neighbor? Like, we've asked that question, or, or can I just go live my own life and, and let them live their lives? I mean, we live in a free country, right? Like, that's what the government says. Or, or, or think about what's happened in the last two weeks when, when George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis and protests turned into riots. People in Walworth County, a predominantly white community, began asking the question, was George Floyd and others like him my neighbor? Are these my neighbors? And, and, and I know you're asking these questions because I can see the stress and I can see the anxiety that's coming from all of us as we're watching all of this hurt and all of these tensions happening all around us and we all feel helpless. And a big part of that, I believe, is because we don't know who our neighbor is. We don't know who our neighbor is. And, and if you're listening to this sermon then you're probably not like the expert in the law that maybe was trying to just kind of squirm around and, and make this pass fail, but you really want to know who is my neighbor. I mean, it's nice outside, right? We're not in the church building yet. You made an effort to go on the internet and join us for worship this morning. You want to know who is my neighbor. It's not because you're trying to find a shortcut. It's because we're overwhelmed, and we want to know what am I called to do. And so thankfully, Jesus gives us an answer. He tells us what we're called to do, and he tells us with a story. Verse 30, he, he answers this question, who is my neighbor, to this religious leader. It says, in, in reply to Jesus, G, or Jesus said in reply to the man, he said, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this was like a 17-mile journey. It was very treacherous, very dangerous, robbers, all sorts of people uh, that you'd come into contact with. And, and he was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. 
A Jewish priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So he saw him and chose to pass by on the other side. So too, a Jewish Levite, when he came and saw to the place and saw this man, he saw him too, not like he didn't notice him, he passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on them. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, said, look after him. And when I come back, if it costs any more to take care of him, I will reimburse you for every extra expense that you might have. Now, I don't have time to, to flesh this out, but I told you this story is, is pretty clear, and it's also very challenging. The first two guys were upright Jewish men, and, and, and I'm not going to get on the bandwagon of, of, of getting on them and make, giving them a hard time. Let's give these guys the benefit of the doubt that they're upright men, that, that they are, know the Jewish law, right? And so they know that that there's some laws in the Old Testament that talk about coming in contact with blood or coming in contact with a dead body. And they know that by helping this man, they could become unclean. Not to mention that if there was a robber that did this kind of damage to that guy, who's to say that robber isn't like 10 feet away waiting to jump on anybody who would try to help him? I mean, it's it's not that we don't want to help, right? But but it would be like the equivalent to you or me driving through a neighborhood that we're not familiar with and and seeing somebody on the side of the road that just got shot. Common sense might say to you and me that that your life matters too, and and it wouldn't be safe to help. Not that I don't want to, but but this guy's already, he's already half dead. He's already naked. Should I really risk my life? This guy probably won't make it through the night. I mean, does God really want two men dead on the side of the road? See, that would be common sense. But you didn't come to church this morning for common sense, did you? See, when we're called to be followers of Christ, the way Jesus is teaching this man and and what it takes to to live and to, to walk the road to heaven, you don't live by common sense. And so Jesus says a third man came down the road, and it was a Samaritan. A Samaritan, it was someone, you got to understand this, because this doesn't come across if we don't understand this culture. Someone, this Samaritan was somebody who lived in a different neighborhood than the man who was hurt. The man who was hurt was a Jewish man, and the Samaritans were of a different ethnicity who for generations have been oppressed by the same group of people as the man who's hurting on the side of the road. Do you see what I'm saying? This would be the equivalent to a slave walking down the road and helping a slave owner on the side of the road. It would be the equivalent in Nazi Germany to a Jewish man or woman walking down the path and helping a Nazi. Jewish people, specifically in Jesus' day, they had defined their neighbor to not include Gentiles and to not include Samaritans. They were excluded from all of those things. And so Jesus tells a story And he tells a story where not only does the Samaritan be the one that steps in and helps the Jewish man, but Jesus is like obnoxious about it. Like, like that's the only word I can think of is how obnoxious the example is. He says that that he didn't just call 911 and wait for an ambulance, but but he literally touched the man. He he became unclean himself. He he poured oil on his wounds. He he carried his his body on his donkey, his own donkey. He he stayed the night in the hospital. He helped nurse him. He didn't just sit out in the waiting room and and then and then when he had to leave he paid all the bills and said open a tab and I will pay every last penny to make this man well when I return because I'm going to come back and Jesus says he asked the question you wanted to know who's the neighbor right who's my neighbor Jesus says verse 36 he says which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers the expert of the law replied the one who had mercy on him. Couldn't even say he was a Samaritan. He said, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You wanted to know what you were called to do? Go and do likewise. And that's it. It's the end of the story. 
So what does it mean, <laughs> right? Like, like what, what, what does it mean? We're all feeling convicted right now. What, what does it mean? Now, again, I'm not, I'm not preaching to the people that are looking for a pass-fail answer or a loophole because I know that you're not the ones watching. We want to be faithful. We want to know who am I called to help? Who is my neighbor? How do I love God and love others as I am overwhelmed with all of the others in the world that are hurting in a world that is just so very broken? And there's two applications that I think speak to what we're dealing with in our world right now for those that want to help. The first one is this. Jesus is the Samaritan in the story. Jesus is the Samaritan in the story. The Samaritan who helps the man on the side of the road is Jesus. And you wouldn't expect that at all because Jesus is Jewish himself and and Jews and Samaritans don't get along. They kick the dust off their feet when they cross over the border. That's how bad their relationship is. But in this parable, Jesus chooses the most unlikely person to help because Jesus is the most unlikely one to help on the side of the road when you and I are the ones who are left broken and robbed and left for dead and naked. And the reason why is because if you think 17 miles on foot between Jericho and Jerusalem is a long walk, if you think that there's a distance between Elkhorn, Wisconsin, and Minneapolis, or Milwaukee, or Chicago, or even your neighbor just down the block, Jesus' neighborhood is heaven. <laughs> like, it's, it's literally heaven. You know how long it takes to walk from earth to heaven? I don't know. And if there was ever a year to type that in Google Maps and find out, this would be the year, right? But you would never be able to figure it out. And see, unlike this religious expert, this law expert, Jesus doesn't have to inherit eternal life because his name is on the deed. That's his neighborhood. Eternal life is Jesus' address. And he left there. He left there because you and I were naked. We were broken. We were cold. We were worried. We were scared. We were anxious. We were oppressed by our sin. And Jesus didn't have to come. He didn't have to come and help you and me. And and if he did, it would mean that he would face indescribable danger in doing so. But you know the story. He did it. And he did it because he loves you. And see, it's, it's obnoxious what he did. It's obnoxious what Jesus did for you and me. He didn't just come. He, he, he didn't just come and bandage our wounds and say, okay, you're off. That's good. That's wonderful. He took your wounds and mine. And he literally placed them on his own body so that he could pay the price for you and me, not just to physically be well, but to inherit eternal life for free. Because just like the man on the side of the road, there was no way that you and I could ever have helped ourselves. And if you believe that to be true, that's the gospel. And if you believe that to be true for you, if you are at all encouraged or challenged or comforted by that, then the only response for you and me is the response Jesus gave to this man, go and do likewise. And I'm going to get really, really practical here about what that means. Friends, it means that if you're white, like me, we need to listen. We need to listen to the black community who are hurting and angry and broken And if you don't think that this affects you and me and our church, I'm just going to tell you that I have had more conversations in the last week about racism and how it is affecting people directly, families in our church, than I have ever had in the last three months from people who have been directly in their families affected by COVID-19. And I'm not saying COVID-19 isn't affecting people. It is. But as far as people getting sick, right, we know we live in an area that hasn't seen it as prevalent as other places. But when I see racism, I've gotten several calls. I've gotten several emails. I had a mom just a couple of days ago asked me to pray for her daughter and her family because they live in a very diverse neighborhood in Chicago and they're black and they're afraid for their lives right now. That same family asked me if we would pray for another friend of theirs who is a Chicago police officer, a good police officer who is facing just incredible pressure and danger in the midst of all of the riots and protests. 
I talked to somebody else from our church whose, whose brother is black and, and works outside and does just a normal job, but because of the color of his skin, people call the police on him all the time. And this has become very real to him and to so many other people that he knows. Friends, this is just, I'm not making this up. These are just conversations I had in this last week. And we're not even gathered in person yet, right? Like, like we have to make an effort to connect with one another. These are our neighbors. And so if that's true, then, then the last question is, what are we called to do? What does it mean to go and do likewise? And, and that too is very simple. Tend to the wounds. Tend to the wounds. Notice what the Samaritan does in Jesus' story. He doesn't, he doesn't bend down to this person on the side of the road and say, what were you thinking? You know that the road from Jericho to Jerusalem is dangerous. Didn't you, didn't you bring protection? Like, do you have a good reason to be here? Do you deserve my help? And yet how many of us ask that same question when we see someone in need? When we ask the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus doesn't do that to us, does he? Did Jesus do that? Did, did, did God ask qualifying questions before he sent his son to save you and me and die on the cross on our behalf? No, because the only qualifier that God ever needed was that he loves us and we were wounded. That's all he needed to know. His response in love was because of that, I'm going to step out, no questions asked, and I'm going to step into the brokenness, and I'm going to tend the wounds. Now, I don't have like three happy hops to peace because we don't live in a world of peace right now, but we follow the Prince of Peace and we just talked last week, it was Pentecost, about how the Holy Spirit dwells within us. It is a fruit of the Spirit's presence inside of us to bring peace. And so if you're looking for peace, if you're looking for peace for your family, but just not just for your family, but for our land, for our country, for our people, then God is calling us to do what the Samaritan did and what Jesus has done for you and me. Kneel down and tend the wounds. Don't walk by and say, this is not my problem. Racism is a very real problem in our country. COVID-19 is, is still a very real problem in our world, as much as many of us are trying to ignore it. And, and many of our neighbors are going through problems that we don't even know what they're facing right now. And, and, and I think the excuse that I most, most often hear is that, that there's still a lot of good people in the world, right? Right? There's still a lot of good people, and a lot of those good people, because of the tensions right now, they're, they're hurting. There's, there's people that, that, that have, haven't done anything wrong, and yet they're in neighborhoods that are being looted and threatened. We've got good police officers that are getting a bad name because of others who aren't. And, and you know what? You're right, if that's how you're thinking. I've thought those things too. It's devastating. Everything that's wrong needs to be called out. All of those things are wrong. But I didn't tell you that, that I was going to come to you and, and show you what was right and wrong. I, I said that, that I would show you what God's word says brings us peace. And the only way to bring peace is if good people kneel too. Not hold up our own righteousness and what we deserve, but if good people kneel too. And, and just one example I saw this week from our own community. I was moved to tears when I was strolling through social media and I saw this photo in the newspaper from our own Walworth County Sheriff, Kurt Picknell, as he was kneeling at a demonstration in Lake Geneva this past week. Now, now I don't know the context of it. I wasn't at that demonstration. I don't know Sheriff Picknell well. I have prayed with him. I've sat with him at, at many different uh, events in the public over the years. I know he's a man of faith. I know he's one of the good officers in our community. And I know he didn't have anything to do with what happened in Minneapolis. But you know what he did? He knelt down this week and he tended to the wounds. Not trying to fix anything, but simply just acknowledging that, that there's a bigger problem that we are all a part of. And so he got down on a knee and he listened. Friends, we may not know all the answers to the questions that we have. We may not have the answers to the problems that our world is facing and looking to solve right now. I know I don't, but Jesus says we don't have to have all the answers. We need to do two things, love God 
and love your neighbor. And so who's your neighbor? It's the people that are hurting right now. And how do we respond? We kneel down, just like Jesus did for you and me, to learn to be humble and to tend to the wounds. So let's do that right now as we pray. Lord Jesus, help us to remember that when we come before you and we pray, prayer is an admission that we need you, that we are at a place in our lives, that, 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 that we need your help, that we need your presence, that we're powerless without you, that, that in a very real sense, spiritually and even physically, God, that, that we're just like the person on the side of the road that's wounded and left for half dead. And so, God, we come before you right now and we bring our wounds, but, Lord, we don't just bring our own wounds, we bring the wounds of those who are hurting the most in our midst. Help us to to see from from your teaching and to be challenged and convicted to know that, that just because somebody doesn't live next door and just because something might not affect us directly because of the circle of people we're a part of or our lack of understanding to the solutions doesn't mean that those who are hurting are not our neighbors. Lord God, I pray that as a church, we would be a people that would stand up for those who are hurting in our world. God, I pray that, that, that even in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, that we would be a people that would follow you in such a way that we would honor and value those who are different from us. God, that we would, we would get down on our knees and we would tend to wounds. And Lord God, we need you to show us the way to do that. And so we ask that you would bless us with wisdom, bless us with humility, bless us with your truth, bless us with other examples of those who are good and who are doing what you have called us to do. You have made us good. All people made in your likeness and image are ultimately wired to live life the way you lived the perfect life you came to live when you came down from your neighborhood in heaven to call us not just your neighbor, but to call us friend and to give us the privilege of our eternal wounds being healed so that our inheritance to eternal life is not something we need to pass or fail. It's already been achieved for us, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done for us. And it's because you love us. Lord God, I pray that that love would permeate our hearts, it would permeate our worries, it would permeate our concerns and our anxiety, but God, that it wouldn't just leave us there, that it would guide us to action, that we may be more like you in the world so that others will be drawn closer to your love, your justice, your mercy, and your peace. It is in Jesus' name we pray. At this time, we'd like to invite you to join together with us as we share in the meal that Jesus has instituted for us in his presence, Holy Communion. If you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, no matter what your background, who you are, where you've been, or where you're going, we want to invite you to grab some bread or a cracker, something you have around the house, some wine, some grape juice, and uh, join us together as we remember what Jesus said 2,000 years ago on the night that he was betrayed. He took bread with his disciples, and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat this, remember me. After the supper, Jesus took the cup of blessing, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, remember me. As often as we eat this bread and as often as we drink from this cup, we remember that Jesus is really with us. And the way we prepare for his presence and his grace and whatever it is that we're facing right now is to surrender to him. And we do so by praying the way that Jesus taught us to pray. If you don't know the words, they're on the screen. 
And we encourage you as a physical sign of surrender to open up your hands as the Spirit of God opens our hearts and we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, if you're with others, I encourage you to serve one another. If you're on your own, we, serve, we are served by the presence of God himself. Take and eat the body of Christ broken. The blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, keep you in his grace, and let us meditate on that grace as we lift up a final praise, a song of praise, and a prayer for our neighborhoods, for our neighbors, for our families, and for our country as we sing praises to our God. Let's see.
thank you for worshiping with us here at St. John's this weekend. Let, we want to leave you with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor, give you his peace. In the name of our God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed week.